trust in the wealth of things. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. The name of more than anything. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. And we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His love never fails. His name will always prevail. We trust in the name of the Lord our we trust in the name of the Lord our we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. Um, I heard earlier this morning that Alabama is out of town. So if you are visiting with us, we are really glad you're here. We got a lot of folks who are gone. A lot of our members are watching online this morning from various places. So why don't we all turn around and wave at the cameras and say, hi folks, glad you're here. Give online. So that always works out real well. So. Now, if you're a guest, thanks for coming to be with us today. We're, we're really glad you're here. If you're traveling, we'll pray for traveling mercies. If you are from town and you're looking for a new church home, we are always looking for new family members. Love to talk with you about how we welcome new folks. There is a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out. Put a, if you have a prayer request, write that down. We will be praying about those things tomorrow morning. We're just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. You can put those in the collection plate when they pass a little bit later in the service. Hey, I got to clear something up from last week. Um, and we don't, I don't always have to do this because I try to be really clear, but just wasn't as clear as it needed to be last week. We're in a series right now called Right on the Money. Uh, me, my stuff, and God, we're aware of the fact that sometimes our stuff and the money that we use to buy stuff can get in the way of God. And I said something last week, it was a confession, I said that I like to shop. And I do, I really like to shop. And I had several of you come up to me after service and say, ooh, I like to shop too, let's go shopping. <laughs> and this is where I wasn't clear. I don't really want to go shopping with you, okay? <laughs> what I want is for you to take me shopping. And there's a big difference <laughs> between those two things. See, if I go shopping with you, I spend my money, and my accountant who's sitting right over here says, I don't have any of that. And if you take me shopping, we spend your money. And that's where, that's where we're at. So I just wanted to clear that up. So I thought it'd be a good idea to go ahead and get this morning's confession out of the way. All right, so here's the other thing that I'm going to confess about me and my stuff and my relationship with God. As I drive up and down the parkway, or even some spots on Whitesburg, or really anywhere around town because we're close to the river and to the lake, I see boats for sale. And whenever I see a boat, something wells up with inside me. And it says, you need a boat. You need a boat. I need a boat. And I, what I want to show you is how easy it is to rationalize that. Okay, so here's the way I think. I see a boat. I see that hydrodynamic form. I see the, the, the gentle, sloping, elegant window. And I think I need to be in that boat. And I could save souls in that boat. <laughs> I could take unbelievers fishing. Out on the, the lake, Lake Gunnersville, I could take him to the river, and we could be out there in the, the gospel boat, is what I would name it. <laughs> and I would, I would say to them, you know, Jesus once walked on water, and Jesus said that I will make you fishers of people. And I'm figuring another five minutes of conversation and prayer, they're going, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? I think that could happen. So what I want to do is urge the elders to buy me the Twickenham boat. <laughs> we could save people. You know, it's, it's that easy. We rationalize our, our possessions and our purchases that easily. We, we make it okay. And what we forget is that we don't need a boat, and we don't need whatever it else is we have in mind. What we need is God. Lincoln, why don't you guys come on up? That's where we're going to focus this morning, is the fact that we don't need something in creation. What we need is something connected to the Creator. That's where we're aiming this morning. That's where our songs will go, our scriptures will go, and later on, our message. Hey, glad you're here. Let's stand. Let's praise the Lord together. 
You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus. Proverbs this morning. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Be seated as we take our offering. 
My only hope is you, Jesus, my only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. My only peace is you, Jesus, my only peace. morning class we were talking about what it means to reflect the image of God, what it means to reflect the image of Christ. And I thought I'd share just a couple of people that I've known that I thought did that in a tremendous way. And, and really, it's, it, was, it was at their funeral that that showed maybe more than ever. And I hope you've had an opportunity at some point to go to a good funeral. Um, you know, somebody that, that lived to be um, a 
ripe old age. They lived life well, and it truly was a celebration of their life. Um, I've been to a couple. My Uncle Larry, although he died um, a little young, uh, he lived life well. At the funeral, um, I'm not big on bodies, so I kind of tend to hover near the back. And um, as, as people came in, you know, every single person that came in, you know, they said, hey, you know, sorry to hear about uh, your loss. And, um, you know, I was Larry's best friend. And, um, I, I mean, there were no less than 100 people. There were easily 500 people who came to this funeral. And there were at least 100, or at least to the visitation, probably 500 people. And there were at least 100 who shook my hand and told me that they were Larry's best friend. And, um, you know, Larry made people feel that way. You know, he would do anything for anybody, and, and he, he made you feel like his best friend. And I think part of that was, was him. He was reflecting that deep love that Christ had for him as he loved other people. Um, another one, Gene Helton died at 87, and... And, I, and it was just a tremendous funeral. It had uh, six kids, and all six of them spoke and told stories about Dad. And a couple of them talked about the same event and how pivotal it was in their life and how it, you know, how it really shaped who they were. And Gene had a deadbeat dad, uh, dropped out on the family, just left them when he was really young. And um, later in life, I don't remember if Gene, I don't remember who reached out, but at some point near the end of his father's life, they reconnected. And he, his father moved to live in Nashville and um, maybe trying to reach out and trying to have a little bit of a life, but his health began to fail and pretty severely. And he you know, didn't have a spouse, uh, never had any kids that, that cared for him. And Gene took him in. And he lived out the rest of his life with Gene taking care of him, you know, hand and foot. And he, the story that his kids told, he said that he sat us down before he did that. And he said, you know, he said, I want you to know that I don't owe that man anything. You know, I... I I don't know him one thing. He was the worst father a person could ever have. But I want you to know that I don't know how I could teach you the love of Christ if I didn't do this for him. And it was, it was Gene, you know, acting out John 15 and 12, love each other as I have loved you. You know, it was Gene reflecting the love of Christ that allowed him to take in a, a worthless man and love him in spite of what he had done to him. And, and that is what I think about as we, as we, as we partake of this, this communion this morning is to think about what, what Romans 5 says that when we were unable to help ourselves, at the right time, Christ died for us, even though we were living against God. Very few people would die to save the life of someone else, although perhaps for a good person, someone would possibly die. But God showed his great love for us in this way, that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. When we didn't deserve it, we didn't earn it we've done everything that we could against and yet that love pours out for us even still let's pray lord i just want to take time to lift up your name to say thank you for loving us in a way that is beyond what we could possibly deserve for sending your son to die to die while we were still in our sin and did not know that we even needed a Savior. And Lord, we pray that as we 
take this, um, take this cup and we take this bread this morning that we can remember that death, we can remember that sacrifice and um, out of that love for us, we can flow out love to others who need you. And it is through your son. Amen. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thy can peace afford. I We need you um, constantly working on our hearts and allowing us to reflect that sacrifice that you made for us as we respond to those that we come in contact with daily. We pray as we continue this Lord's Supper that we can, can reflect on that love, can reflect on what it means, and then on how we respond throughout this week. It's through your Son again that we pray.
I need thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. I come to Thee, I need Thee every hour, most holy one, oh make me Thine indeed, God, we need you more and more and more. And we need less of things and stuff. God bless Jody as he brings the message to us today from your word. And all glory and honor and power forever and ever is due yours. In Jesus' name we pray and all the degrees say, amen. amen. Let's stand together. Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I Sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, where you are. Teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. You're my one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Be seated. 
If you want to uh, turn in your Bibles or on your devices to Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to start this morning, Matthew chapter 6, first book in the New Testament, and we'll pick up there in just a minute. Uh, one program note, and then I want to introduce somebody to you. In August, we are going to just try a new thing for the month of August. We're going to, get, the spring is our um, instrumental service that we have once a month on Sunday nights. We thought it would be interesting if just for the month of August, we moved that to Wednesday nights and had it, every, there are five Wednesdays in August, we had it every Wednesday night in August, and we're going to do a, a dessert, like at 6.15, a dessert and coffee, and then we're going to enter into a time of worship, and I'm going to do some teaching during that. Typically, I don't teach during the spring, but we're going to add some teaching time to that in a series called, What Would Jesus Ask? And we're going to look at five questions that Jesus asked people in the Gospels and let him ask those questions to us. It'll be a challenge. Now, not everybody's comfortable with that. There will be a class offered on Wednesday nights if you want to be a part of that. But if, you'd not, if Wednesday night is not normally in your routine, this could be a really neat thing for you to right in the middle of the week, have a time of praise, great to bring a friend to, because, you know, in the Churches of Christ, we're kind of weird because when you walk in the door, you're in the band, but this way they get to hear a band and worship at the same time. So it'll be kind of a neat thing to invite a friend to. That'll be Wednesday nights in August for the five weeks, and then we'll go back to our regular schedule in September. Just wanted to put that out there for you to be thinking about. Okay, we have been, how you doing in the balcony? You guys still awake? Good, good. Bellamy, you watch out for me, okay? Okay. So I want to introduce somebody new to you. We've been praying and hoping and waiting for Caleb and Ashley Gendron to join us, our new youth ministers, and they are here this morning. You guys come on up. Would you give them a big hand and welcome them? We're glad to have them. And let me go ahead and have, uh, I want to have all our elders, our shepherds and their wives come on up. We're going to have a prayer with Caleb and Ashley for just a second, so all the elders and wives come on up, and just want to welcome you guys from Nashville, Blacksburg, Virginia is where you're from, yep. and Sacramento. Sacramento, California, so we're going to let the Sacramento, Californian speak first, and just let us know how glad you are to be with us, and how... <laughs> I'm breathing down my neck. <laughs> and how you have the, just happy because Twickenham's got a preacher, and all that good stuff, so. Yeah, we're so excited to be here, thank you guys so much for... Um, welcoming us into your family. Um, we are just eager to be with your students. We're eager to be with you. You'll hear us say it all, time and time again, but our mission is that your students and you know that God loves you, that we love you, and that this is a safe space to ask questions and wrestle with your faith. Um, so yeah, we're excited to get going on that. And um, I just want to say also I'm very excited to be here. I love days like today because um, I feel like they're just defined by love. Like I look around and see everyone's new face, and I know it's a bunch of our family and friends, our brothers and sisters. So thank you guys for being so warm um, or welcoming to us. Um, excited to meet everyone. We're going to hang around after um, service, so please come up and, and say hi. I know we met a lot of you two months ago, but we would love to meet everyone again. And um, as always, I like to say, forgive us, because we'll probably forget names we've met already. But we really want to meet everyone and uh, get to know you guys as soon as possible. So thank you guys for welcoming us. Ken Smith, one of our shepherds, is going to lead us in a prayer for Caleb and Ashley. Let's just all gather around these guys here and put our hands on them and bless them for this beginning. Father, we recognize you as creator of the universe, and uh, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for um, all the blessings that we have as, as your people. And uh, we thank you this morning for sending uh, Caleb and Ashley here. And we just pray your, pray your blessings on them, Father, as ministers of the gospel, as people that, uh, that love you, first of all, but, but love other people that love um, youth. And uh, we just pray that you would give them strength and courage, Father, in every challenge associated with their ministry here. We pray that you will um, walk beside them as they, uh, as they do their work and in in everything, in every aspect of that, we pray that they'll reach out to you for guidance. We pray for the youth of this congregation, Father, and for, um, for their willingness to be countercultural in their daily walk with you, for their, um, 
for their place in, uh, in their families. We pray for uh, Caleb and Ashley as they play such an important part in their spiritual formation. We pray for each family, Father, in this church. We pray for uh, all the ministers. We pray for each of us as we endeavor to be your people on a daily basis. In Christ's name, amen. 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 So we're going to do a little, something a little bit, um, it's not unusual, we just don't always do it every Sunday. At the end of the message this morning, we are going to extend what we call in our uh, tribe an invitation. Some churches call it an altar call. And what we just want to do is provide you an opportunity to come forward if you need to at the end of the sermon and ask for prayer. Uh, there may be something in the, in the message that addresses a concern that you have, or it may be something that you've just been wrestling with. So just think about that toward the end of the service, uh, toward the end of the sermon, this message. We'll have a song, and if you want to come down, I'll be here. Several of our shepherds will be here, and we'll pray with you and just uh, receive you if, you, if you're ready to, to, be, to be prayed over and have whatever is going on addressed in prayer. Or if you are, you've been thinking about giving your life to Christ in baptism, you've studied that, you're ready to do it. We can certainly accommodate you at that moment. We'll be glad to be late to lunch in order to witness you being born into Jesus Christ. If you want to begin a study about that kind of thing, we'd love to talk about that as well. So just want to give you a heads up. That's coming at the end of the message. Right now we're in Matthew chapter 6, and I just want to go ahead and get our text out there in front of us. I'll be uh, beginning reading in verse 19, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. We did this last week, but I, want to, I want to just want to hear the words of Jesus again. Uh, before we get into them. So here we go, verse 19. Do not, Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will love the one and uh, you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So last week we looked at the, the middle two verses in that passage, verses 22 and 23, the part about the eyes, two perspectives on our possessions. Jesus called those two perspectives a healthy outlook, uh, a perspective characterized by gratitude, generosity, loosely holding on to our possessions, and he called the other perspective an unhealthy Outlook, the one that, uh, one that sees possessions as a way of keeping sto a score or establishing status or securing happiness. And he said that if you have a bad perspective on your possessions, that you're not just in the dark, the darkness is in you. And so we ended up by asking seven questions last week to try to help us diagnose our perspective? Are we, are we really seeing things in terms of our possessions as we need to? And I just want to put those seven questions up again this morning just to remind you, do I need numbers to define happiness? If my happiness comes with, with a dollar figure or a model year, then I've got a perspective problem. Uh, am I spending all or more than I earn? You, you, we got three options when it comes to our money. You, you can spend Less than you earn, you can spend all you earn, or you can spend more than you earn. If, if you and I are spending all of it, or more of it, we, we may have a perspective problem. It's not the only problem we could have, but it, it could be a problem of perspective. Um, in my years of recruiting doctors, I would, I would talk to doctors, and they would ask me what the salary of a particular position was, and sometimes it would be as high as $300,000 a year base salary, and they would say, well, that's just not enough. And I would say, well, you, after a while, and talking to a lot of young doctors, I would say, look, you don't have an income problem if $300,000 is not enough. You have a spending problem if $300,000 is not enough. 
Sometimes we've got to get that perspective. Okay, third question, am I being financially honest? If I'm sacrificing my integrity on the altar of acquisition, I got a perspective problem. Do I wish my health insurance covered retail therapy? That was my confession last week, right? I love the shop. And the problem is that if I have to buy a thing to feel a feeling, I've got a problem. I've got a perspective problem. Do I buy to win? Are, are, are my possessions and my money just a way of keeping score? Am I trying to, to win some game? We talked about Monopoly last week and what a horrid game that is. Some people live their lives that way. Has my credit card become a necessary extension of my income? If I'm borrowing from tomorrow to pay for today, I have a perspective problem. And then number seven, am I failing to give? Am I not being generous? If I'm not giving, if it's all for me, then I've got a perspective problem. That was last week. Aren't you glad you weren't here? So this week, I want us to look at the first part of the passage where Jesus says, verse 19, do not store up. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. So here's the, immediately raises a question. Here's the question. Is Dave Ramsey going to hell because he told you to store up? He told you to save up. Does that mean that you should empty your savings account? Does that mean that you should sell your stocks? Should you liquidate the equity in your house? Because if ever there was a treasure stored up on earth, it would be your house, right? It's right there on the earth. Are we, are we sinners if we save? Is that what he's saying? Here's a cardinal rule for, for a biblical interpretation. If you're, gonna, if, you're, if you're reading the Bible and you, you see a passage and you say, okay, this is what it means. If my interpretation of one passage puts it in conflict with another passage, I should take another look at my interpretation because it's probably wrong. And so my surface reading of this passage makes it sound like Jesus is telling me, telling you, telling us that it's wrong to save. He says, do not store up. It sounds like it's wrong. It's a sin to store up. That seems, that seems to be what he's saying, right? Well, the problem is that there are other passages that counsel us to do precisely that, to save, to store up. Proverbs. Proverbs is the Twitter of the Bible, right? So chapter 21, verse 20. Here's what it says. The wise store up. Jesus seems to be saying it's a sin to store up. Solomon is saying the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Proverbs chapter 30, um, chapter, chapter 30, verses 24 and 25. Four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Not just wise, this is exceptional wisdom. This is wisdom above the wise. This is extremely wise. Answer creatures of little strength, and yet they store up their food. And then there's Paul in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says, now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So he's telling the church at Corinth to do something that he told the churches in Galatia to do. So apparently this is what he tells everybody. And what he said was, on the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up. If you grew up in the Church of Christ, you know that what Paul really said was lay by in store on the first day of the week. So it sounds like Solomon and Paul are urging us to store up, but Jesus is telling us not to store up. So who should we follow? All three. Because they're talking about different things. Paul and Solomon are talking about what you do with your money. Jesus is talking about what your money does to you. Different things. Jesus is not talking about an emergency fund that you saved up for a rainy day. You should have one of those. He's not talking about a retirement plan to make sure that you have enough to support you when you finally stop work. You should have one of those. The words store up and treasure in back in there, Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasure. The words store up and treasure come from the same word. You know, the word is thesaurus. It's kind of cool. 
thesaurus. It's treasure. So if you, if you had been on the mountain that day listening to Jesus speak, here's, here's the way you would have heard it. Do not treasure up for yourselves treasures on earth. He's not focused on our valuables. He's focused on our values. He's not criticizing us for treasuring things. He's asking us, what things do you count as treasure? Here's a way to think about it. If I brag about it, if I attach status to it, if I derive status from it, if I wonder what I would do if I lost it, it's a treasure. It matters. Some of you are Lord of the Rings fans. Okay, you remember, you probably already thought about this, the character Gollum, who is obsessed with the ring of Saruman. We want it. We need it, the precious. What you call your precious, that's what Jesus is talking about. And again, he's not telling us it's wrong to value, to care about, to treasure things. He's warning us about which things we treasure. And so what he says is, do not treasure up for yourself treasures on earth. Why not? Well, the answer is in the second part of verse 19. Because earthly treasures are insecure. He mentions moths, vermin, thieves. Some of your versions will say moths, rust, and thieves. And what he's saying is this. You don't want to put your hope in. You don't want to build your life around. You don't want to stake your status to things that can be consumed, depreciated, used up, worn out, stolen, lost, destroyed, rendered obsolete. If it comes with a sell-by date or a model year, or if each new iteration of it comes with a, with a number higher than the one before, Windows 10, Android 7.0, Adobe Flash 1976.2, it is not going to provide you with a robust return on investment. It is going to let you down. If it's a created thing, it's going to let you down. Have you, have you experienced that? Really, have you? I have. If I, could just, if I could just get that car or this house or that job or that relationship or that award or that salary or that position or title or degree or recognition or accomplishment or wardrobe or dress size or waistline or target weight or boat, and then you get it. And you're not happy because no created thing can fill the creator-shaped hole in your soul. The stories, stories help, don't they? Jesus told a story about this very thing. Luke chapter 12, a couple of books over, Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 12. So here's how Luke sets it up. Someone in the crowd, so Jesus is in a crowd, kind of like he was back in Matthew chapter 6. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, is that not, that may sound familiar to you. I hope it doesn't. But how many times have families gone to war or court or silent over money or possessions? So Jesus replies, verse 14, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? And then he said, then Jesus said, be on your guard, watch out for all kinds of greed. You know, it's interesting that Jesus says, watch out for all kinds of greed. We talked last week about how greed's a vampire. You can't see it in the mirror. Nobody ever thinks they're greedy. Nobody ever, th nobody ever thinks, uh, now other people are greedy. Those, those other people, now that's greed right there. I just need a little bit more, right? We, don't, we can't see it in ourselves. So it's interesting that Jesus says, watch out for that, because that's a real thing. And, and there are all kinds of greed, and they'll get you. And then he gives us this great definition of greed. He said, he said greed, well, he's, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Greed, it, greed is thinking that life consists in accumulating more of whatever you have or one of what you don't. 
And so he, then he tells them the story. Now I want you to pay attention to the first person pronouns in this story, okay? The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Life does not consist in the abundance. The ground of a certain rich man yielded abundance. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain, let it for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And then Jesus ends by saying, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God, which is exactly what he said in Matthew 6. The guy in Jesus' story treasured up created things and was spiritually bankrupt. Now, this is really, really important, this this next part, this next sentence, super important. Don't miss this. If you checked out, check back in. I want you to hear this. Success was not this guy's sin. The guy in the story, the farmer who had the abundant crop, success was not his sin. He was not spiritually bankrupt because he was a good farmer. It's what success did to him. And it's what it can do to you or to me. If if you are successful, you can begin to think that you are wise enough, smart enough, that you are enough to run every other aspect of your life. And the danger of having resources is that it opens up opportunities for you to do just that. You can can be deceived into thinking that you know what is best for you. That, and the truth is you probably know what's better for everybody else too. That your success in one area of your life means that you are master and commander in all areas of your life and you can very slowly, very subtly reach the conclusion that you don't need God. The Bible calls that idolatry. Treasuring created things, thinking that the created things can meet all my needs, is just about the oldest sin in the Bible. In his commentary on Luke, Daryl Box said, to define life in terms of things, to define your life in terms of things, is the ultimate reversal the creature, the creature serving the creation and ignoring the creator. Jesus told another story about a successful farmer, Luke chapter 8. Well, semi-successful. This farmer goes out and sows seed and some seed falls on the path and it's trampled and eaten by birds. Some falls on rocky soil and the roots can't find purchase. Some of it falls among thorns and weeds choke the life out of the plants. And then when Jesus explained the story, He said, here's what it's really about. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked. Look at this. They're choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. If we're not careful... We, we can succeed at, at, at whatever area of life we're in and we begin to think we don't need God. That success can be deadly. It can choke the life out of your faith and that's a really slow way for a faith to die. So how do we know? How do we know whether we've got treasure on, if, if, how do I know whether I'm storing up treasure on earth? I mean, am I, am I doing that? We ended last week with seven questions. Let's in this week with seven questions. Last week it was about perspective. This week it's about what we treasure. And here's what we're really asking. We're, we're really asking, what has my heart? Back in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, 
where, where, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In the Bible, the heart is the control center for the emotions, the will, the intellect of a human being. Your heart is the place where you feel joy and sorrow, fear and courage and every other emotion. It's the place where we decide, where our choices are made. The Bible talks about laying things to heart. That means considering them carefully, thinking about them. The heart can devise plans. The heart is the Bible word for your interior life. Your thoughts, your emotions, your intellect, your will. Jesus says that wherever you're, whatever you're, whatever you treasure, that has your heart. Kind of adds new meaning to the image of a treasure chest. So forget what's in your wallet. Let's ask what's in your treasure chest. Seven questions. How to know if I'm treasuring things on earth or things in heaven. Number one, am I praying? Am I a praying person? Prayer is your check engine light. That's your canary in the coal mine. That's your early warning system. If you're not praying, something is wrong. It could be that you're not praying. There are a lot of reasons why people don't pray, okay? But one of the reasons could be that you think you don't need God. All your needs are being met, or, all your, you, or you think all my needs can be met by something in creation, by some created thing. So you don't, you don't feel a real need to turn to the creator. If you're not praying, your treasures may be earthbound. Number two, do you have a boat? <laughs> That's the metaphorical boat, right? Like the one I talked about at the beginning this morning. Is there something, is there some thing that you think will complete you, make you happy, fulfill your dreams? Look, my boat's a boat, okay? I know that. Maybe yours is a car. Maybe it's a house. Maybe it's a relationship. Your boat could be another person. Your boat could be somebody you're not married to. If you have a boat, some thing, some created thing that you think you must have to be complete, you're treasuring the wrong things. You're treasuring earthly things. Number three, is your phone a scoreboard? Is your phone a scoreboard? A, that's a wonder. The, our phones, our smartphones, amazing devices, marvelous gifts. We can keep up with each other more effectively. We can text encouraging messages to each other and important information. If we get into trouble, we can call for help. Grandparents love getting those videos and pictures of their grandchildren. You can call your mom anytime. You should call your mom. We can also use our phones or our tablets or our laptops as nothing more than a scoreboard. Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, all the others can become just one more way we have of comparing ourselves to other people. I follow a guy on one of my social media accounts who is constantly posting pictures of these sumptuous meals that he's eating and these exotic places that he's visiting and these important things he's thinking and these cool people that he's meeting and he's on a boat. <laughs> and if I'm not careful, if I'm not careful... I can feel the envy rising up within me. And when I feel envy, I know I'm treasuring things on earth. I'm not treasuring things in heaven. So is your phone a scoreboard? Number four, this is going to leave a mark, okay? Is my spending driven more by my diversions or by my devotion to God? Is my spending driven more by my diversions or by my devotion to God? Okay, let's forget about shelter, food, transportation, medical care. I'm not talking about the necessities. Think about what you spend on entertainment, vacations, golf, concerts, theater, SEC football weekends, the boat, your diversions. Nothing wrong with getting away from it all. Nothing wrong with enjoying life. But if I spend more on my amusement than I do on the things that awaken God's concern, kind of hard to say I'm laying up treasures in heaven. Number five, this one's going to leave a mark too. Do your kids spend more time pursuing athletic, artistic, or academic trophies than they do pursuing spiritual priorities? Do your kids spend more time pursuing artistic, Athletic, 
academic trophies than they do pursuing spiritual priorities. Look, I know it's not either or, okay? I know you can do both. Oakland Raiders' Derek Carr recently signed a $125 million five-year contract. $125 million over five years. Reporters ask him the obvious question, what are you going to do with all that money? And the first thing he said was, I'm going to tithe to my church. So if you're an NFL quarterback and you're looking for a church home, we are looking (laughs) for new family members. That was an awesome testimony that guy made. That was awesome. He said that to reporters. And then he said this about the money. He said, I'm very thankful to have it, that it's in our hands because it's going to help people not only in this country, but a lot of countries around the world. Look, being active, being active in sports and the arts and the academy and science is exactly where Christians need to be. But often, parents, we get stars in our eyes and we entertain thoughts of raising up the next great American athlete or novelist or musician or scientist and we schedule God right out of our kids' lives. Number six. Is generosity a part of my budget or do I do it on impulse? Is generosity a part of my budget or do I give on impulse? This one's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, if generosity is a part of my budget, that means I've made it a priority. I have decided ahead of time at the beginning of the year or the quarter that I am going to intentionally devote a part of my earthly treasure to a heavenly purpose. The second reason this was important is because it protects me from guilt-driven impulse giving. Here's the thing I want you to do. If I ever guilt you into giving, I want you to call me on it. Now, I didn't say if you ever feel guilty, okay? Because some of us do feel guilty and probably should, all right? But if if you ever see me use guilt to try to get you to give, I want you to call me on it. Because giving that's driven from guilt is not coming from God. That's not godly giving. Godly giving is when we recognize that what we have is a gift of God, that it's a resource He's given us, and that we're supposed to use that to bless others. That's the right kind of giving, and that's the kind I want you to do, the kind I want to do, the kind I want us to do. So when, I'm, when I make generosity a part of my budget, then, I'm, then I'm, I'm freed up from guilt and I'm freed up from impulse giving. Okay, number seven, last one. And I'm indebted to Tim Keller for this is a beautiful formulation. Am I giving my life for my treasures or did my treasure give his life for me? Keller says that... Um, Every other treasure in the world says, give your life to purchase me. Jesus said, I'm the one treasure who died to purchase you. And that's the gospel. The stuff that we have, the cars that we drive, the houses, the portfolios, the, the, the stocks, the money, the things that money can buy, everything that is created, anything that's created that's a part of the material world, none of that, none of that is going to take care of us. None of that is going to satisfy. None of that is going to secure. The only thing that's going to take care of you and me and satisfy you and me and save you and me is Jesus Christ. He is the treasure who gave himself up for us. So, This morning, maybe you're ready to give your life to him in baptism. If you are, oh, what a glorious day. That would be so awesome. We'd love to be a part of that. If you're not ready to do that, but you're intrigued by it, would you please let us sit down and and just let's look at the Bible together and see what it says and, and, and study that together. Learn, see what scripture says about our being separated from God by sin, about how there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, no thing on earth and nothing we can do can save us, but, but God sent his son to save us.
Can we, I'd love to talk with you about that and, and how we respond to that. Maybe this morning you're living, a, you kind of live in some of the things that we've talked about here. You really thought something in creation would save you, and now you've realized how much you need God. And tell us about that. We'll pray with you over it. Maybe there's something totally unrelated to the message this morning. You're just struggling with a need, a burden, and you're tired of doing it alone. Let us pray for you. We're going to stand, we're going to sing, and if you need to come, I hope you will. Let's sing. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken, by the fall, Jesus ready, stands to save you, full of pardoning love for all. He is able, He is able, He is with for being here this morning. A couple of things as we close. Uh, Teens, you guys have Sunday fun day. I hear it's kiddie pool kickball. Not sure how that works, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. Um, Also, Beach Blast money is due today, so get that in if you're planning to go to Beach Blast next week. Uh, TCM, Children's Ministry, Terrific Tuesday this week is Despicable Me at Hollywood 18, so join them at 10 o'clock, and don't forget dinner at a Devo Wednesday night. We're having poppy seed chicken. You can get tickets um, outside the doors to my right. And Jody, where did Jody go? Right Say, I'm, I'm liking the boat thing. I, what about a Twickenham Corvette convertible? <laughs> then we could get back and forth from the river where your boat is to evangelize more people yes. really fast. Amen. All right, there we go. I'm getting a Corvette. Have a great week. Let's close in prayer. Bow with me, please. Dear Father, we praise your name, Lord. We are so thankful that we were able to be here this morning, that you have brought us together. Lord, I pray that... uh, Our hearts have been moved by this message and that we will uh, seek the treasure that you have uh, laid before us throughout throughout all the ages, Lord, your your only son given to us in such a wonderful way, Lord, and I pray that we will seek after him and his kingdom, that we will uh, treasure uh, our times together like this, our, our participation in this community, Lord, that I pray that the, the earthly blessings you have given us, that we will Use those in a way that will bring glory to your name throughout this community, that we will uh, be looking out for those who are less fortunate than us, Lord, in that way, that we will um, bring the good news to their ears. Lord, we are so thankful this morning for Caleb and Ashley joining us, and I pray great blessings on their ministry here with uh, our youth. 
Lord, I pray that we will uh, all pull in the same direction as we seek to be your kingdom on this earth. Through Christ, I pray. Amen.